book after the beginning which is Genesis chapter 3 Exodus the third chapter and the first six verses Exodus 3 1 1 through 6 and when you have found it 
Just say amen. amen. <laughs> I will be reading out of the uh, New International Version, NIV. <clears throat> now Moses was tending the flock of Jephro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight while the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face, because he was afraid to look at God. So in if the reading of God's holy, magnificent, perfect, and endurable word. Bow your head with me in a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we approach your throne, having been given access through the blood of Jesus Christ. We ask of one thing here this moment in this worship setting. Do not let us leave here with the baggage that we brought in. Strip us of ourselves and all of the distractions around us, all of the things that are, that are swirling through our minds. Refocus us on Jesus. Forgive us now for all of our sins. We pray in your holy and your awesome name, we ask it. May we all say together, amen. amen. I want to thank the choir for that hymn that you sang, uh, Guide Me, O Thy Great Jehovah, that has always been my favorite. And that is almost, really, that is my faith testimony. I would like for us this morning to look at the person the personage of Moses. You've heard his name. I don't know how much you know about him, how much you've read about him. Like most people, maybe, the only thing that, um, that you're familiar with is that he led some people out of Egypt. And through Cecil DeMille's and his Ten Commandments years ago, I think just about everybody knows now he parted the Red Sea. But this morning I want us to go back and look at the real Moses, who God was calling. And I want to use as a theme thought, when you hit rock bottom, then what? When you hit rock bottom, then what? I want you to go back with me to very briefly when Moses was born and how God made certain then because he knew in the counsel of his eternal will that he was going to be using this man 40, 80 years later. And God made certain that Moses was not slaughtered like other babies that had been decreed by Pharaoh, how his mother hid him. 
And it wasn't by an accident that when she put him in the uh, little basket made of bulrushes and it floated downstream and landed right where Pharaoh's daughter was bathing, it wasn't an accident that when she looked at the child, the child looked so beautiful until he just captured her heart. It wasn't an accident that she decided to adopt the baby, bring him into her home, into, her, into the palace rather, and into her bosom. It was not an accident that he became her own, so to speak, blood son, and that she raised him in an atmosphere that then compared to now would even, I would say, go beyond what, um, what the Queen of England and all of the fancy, th fancy things that she has and what, what the um, royal family of England provides for their, um, for their sons, grandchildren. Moses was raised in the finest of the fine. He ate the finest food. He wore the finest clothes. He was given in that day top-notch education, learning mathematics, learning history, all of the arts and sciences, never spared anything that he needed, servants at his beckoning call. He was also trained, being there in Pharaoh's palace, he was trained to be a warrior, a statesman. He was trained to have wisdom and how to use his mind to strategize in warfare. Moses was indeed a child with a silver spoon. No, he was a child with a golden spoon. One day something happened. And God has peculiar ways of disturbing our lives. Moses had a trembling in his soul. And he knew something was wrong because when he looked at the Egyptians and then looked at the Hebrews, there was something that disturbed him. He didn't know what. And this particular day, there were two Hebrews, they were arguing, and there was a confrontation between them. So Moses felt a strong attraction to go up to them, even though he was a so-called Egyptian. And he tried, to, he tried to act as arbitrator. He tried to make certain that the two parties involved, that... Uh, they would come down. And then God, in his sovereign providence, one of the Hebrews said to him, oh, so now you're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian. Moses thought that his secret was hid because he had buried the Egyptian body who was a taskmaster that had been beating one of the Israelites. He felt then that, well, if they know, everybody knows. So Moses fled from Egypt and went into the wilderness. Not accidentally, but by divine providence. One day he happens to run into some very calmly and handsome young ladies that were... Uh, watering their stock. And there were some other shepherds that came in and tried to push them out of the way and to let their stock water first. And Moses, seeing this injustice, jumped in. And uh, anyway, he prevailed. And uh, they were able to water their stock. And uh, so after they got through, they went home. 
told the father, Jephro, what had happened. And he said, why didn't you invite the man to come and to dine with us? So they went and found him, brought him back. He dined with them, and as God so ordered that he became a part of the family until he married one of the daughters of Jephro. And we are told in this encounter by him that he had a son. Life is now not in the cream of the crop anymore. Life for Moses now is not in royalty. It is not in power. It is not in wealth. It's not in honor. But now Moses is nothing but a shepherd. And shepherds in those days were the lowest on the social order. And all he did from morning till night was to tend sheep and woolly goats. Moses' life is divided equally and not accidentally into three segments. Forty years in Egypt, forty years in the wilderness, and then forty years in terms of leading the people. One day, he's carrying these smelly sheep, and he decides to go a little bit further into the desert than he had gone before. And he went to a mountain, not accidentally, and I, I want you to get every time I say that, because he didn't know it, but God was rerouting his life. He went to this mountain of God, Mount Horeb, and as he was leading the flock of sheep and goats, he saw a bush. Now, normal physics says that anything that burns, burns up and becomes cinders and ashes. But when he passed by, the, book was, the bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed, which meant that it was not crumbling in the fire. And Moses never seen anything like this because this was against what nature demonstrates. And so he says to himself, let, let me look to see and find out what's going on here. God now has gotten his attention. He's gotten him away from all of these other distractions. Moses comes close to the bush, and all of a sudden, a phenomena occurs. God speaks through the bush. And he calls Moses' name twice. And then Moses responds by saying, here I am. And then before God gives him his instructions and commissions him, he tells him who he is. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then he says to him, take off your sandals. Don't come any closer because you are approaching dangerously holy ground. Now, I want to use this encounter, and I want us to look at some, some uh, implications here that just leaped out at me, and, I, and, and I'm not going to kid you. I read this incident one time, and in... 30 minutes, the Holy Spirit had given me the outline of this message. Something happens when we encounter God. And I want to suggest that there are five things that were critical in the encounter at the bush that also parallels in terms of our bush encounter. Because we don't walk by a bush that's burning, but believe me, there are a whole lot of bushes that look different, but God is trying to get our attention. The first thing that I want to lift here that I think is germane to this text is that when one comes into the majestic presence of God, you don't approach him with 
who you think you are. When you come into the majestic presence of God, you don't approach him flippantly, lackadaisically with who you think you are. In other words, you don't present your credentials to God because God knows who you are. You don't, you, you don't, you don't need to let him know in terms of how many degrees you got, what schools you have attended, the pedigree of your family. And in terms of the influential people that you know, he ain't concerned about that. He knew, in fact, he knew you before you knew yourself. In fact, let's go a little bit further back because David tells in Psalm 139, he knew me even before I came into my mother's womb. So he's not concerned about that. And many times, I think maybe unconsciously, sometimes maybe stupidly and foolishly, when God calls us, we want to feel as though that we're somebody and that God should be privileged that we are in his company. In other words, we reverse the order. But you got to understand who is enduring in this picture. Who lasts forever? Not my flesh. I'm going to die. Everything that I am, that I hope to be, that I leave behind, 50 years from now when I'm dead, nobody would have even remembered my name. But God lives forever. And we have to embrace that when we not only in the presence of worship, but I'm talking about every day of our lives from Monday to Sunday, 24-7, whether you're at home, on your job, you're at the supermarket, whether you're at the Galleria, whether you're driving your car, whether you're talking, conversationalizing with a friend, it doesn't matter. Wherever we are, whatever you do and say, it is being recorded by heaven. And you are in the awesome presence of God. That is, I feel, one of the maybe most hideous most, uh, most evil and devilish problems that our culture is in now because people have no respect for the presence of God. There used to be a time, and I know you hear that, uh, that phraseology uh, many times, you know, in the old days it used to be and blah, 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 I understand that. And I admit that there were some things in the past that we need to or we should have discarded and thrown out the window. But then there were some good, good things in the past that should be retained. And one of those things is having respect for God. Because when you respect God, you respect other people. And have you noticed we know how folk don't respect other people today? Trace it back up. They don't respect God. God means nothing to them. Another, another statement that I want to lift here is that whenever God halts you in life, that is holy ground. Wherever he stops your train, your schedule, your thought pattern, your plans, whatever it is, wherever he what says stop, halt, no further, that spot, if you want to use that terminology, is holy ground. Moses was stopped on sand in a desert. God can stop you in your car on concrete pavement. He can stop you in snooks or deerbergs or shop and save or save a lot. He can shop you while you're reaching out getting a bunch of greens or picking some tomatoes. It don't matter where it is. When he halts you, that is holy ground. And the reason why it's holy ground, because he's there. And when he speaks, God doesn't speak with, uh, with a quiet authority. He does not speak with book authority. He does not speak with congressional authority. He speaks with authority of past ages, present ages, and hope for fears to come. He speaks with eternity. And when he says, stop, 
you better stop. Because people who have decided that they are going to do it their way, I don't know whether they understood it then, but if they are still alive now, they understand it now. God can smash you to smithereens. He can crack you. He can break you. He can shatter you. I don't care in terms of how great you are. I don't care in terms of how much of thought and power you get. God can break you if you do not recognize his holy ground. Third thing I want to lift is this. Is that this event is a transforming event that is always branded in your soul. You'll never forget it. Because it is a sacred moment. Moses never forgot that burning bush. And you know why? Because you know Moses wrote Exodus. This is in a way, this is, this is his autobiography. How is it that he couldn't forget it? Can anyone forget where God met you the day that he saved your soul? Can you forget it? Can't forget it. You'll forget a whole lot of other things. And I'll tell you something else too. All Alzheimer's can't erase it out of your memory. Story was told about an old saint and as she was aging, she was losing her mind. And she had a favorite scripture. And that scripture said that he will do all things according to his glory. And as she got uh, declining and losing in terms of thought process, then it narrowed down to one word as she was lying moments away from death. She couldn't remember everything else, but she could remember he. And that's all that she said when she closed her eyes. He, he, he. And out of all of everything that had been erased from her mind, she remembered him. I don't care who you are when you are really saved. Now, I'm not talking about religiously saved. You know there's a difference. You can be religiously in a congregation. You can religiously join a church. You can religiously participate in ministries, but it doesn't mean your soul is saved. Pharisees were religious. Sadducees were religious. And they felt as though because they could interpret the law, that they could write the law, that it gave them the right to say and to do whatever they please. And that's the reason why Jesus always rubbed them the wrong way. Because they were going this way, he was going that way, and he was always lifting up in terms of their snobbishness in terms of their arrogance, their selfishness, and their pride. And he always told them that, uh, in fact, the, uh, the other people, the populace, don't be like them. Because if you be like them, you're not going to see my kingdom. The only way you, you can see my kingdom, you got to have the spirit and the heart and attitude of a child. Come in with no expectations, not who you think you is, nothing like that. Stripped of everything and just say as the uh, writer says, Lord, I come to thee a sinner all defiled. Take the stain of guilt away and own me as thy child. Whenever God calls your name, he claims you. When he calls your name and changes your heart and your mind, he claims you. You're his. You belong to him. And use that old terminology, lock, stock, and barrel, which means you're sold out to God. But unfortunately, painfully, 
there are some believers in Christ that want to be sold out to Jesus as far as they want to let him, well, take over. But then they also want to have a playpen in the world. Do you understand what I mean? Like Jesus said one day, he said, you cannot serve God and mammon. He said, in other words, it's impossible for one person to obey two commands that are opposite. Halt, run, sit, talk. You can't do it. You got to obey one or the other, but you cannot obey both at the same time. Number four, when God stops you, listen to this, it is on his terms and not yours. When he stops you, he's not going to let you read out a laundry list of what you want to do and what you've been going through and how hard it's been and you want him to do this, you want him to do that. Uh-uh, no, no. When he stops you, he stops you and it's on his terms. You don't talk to him, he talks to you. And that's a problem even a lot of believers have in their journey of faith. Even when they're praying, they're telling God, Lord, go here, go there. I need this, I need that. Do this, do that. And they never take time to be silent and quiet and to listen to the voice of God. I'm going to ask you a question right now. How many of you here this morning have a secret praying place? Raise your hand. Now, when I say secret, I don't mean, you know, a place where nobody knows it. You got the key to it. And all. Uh -uh. It could be in your house. Like mine is in my house. And I tell you exactly where mine is. It's in my bathroom. Where I can shut the door. Grandchildren, get out, get out. Don't bother me. Tell my wife, phone ring, you answer it, take the message. But I don't want to be bothered. And I take my books in there. And I take my daily word and everything else I think the Holy Spirit wants me to have. And just have a good time. <laughs> and let my soul bathe. In the word of God. And many times when you come to God, don't come to God saying, well, Lord, this is what I need, this is what I want. Come to him and say, Lord, what is your will? What do you want me to do and to say today? What directions and plans you have for my life this day? So when he stops you, it's on his terms and not yours. This journey is not a man-made project, but it is a God project. This plan, we didn't put it together. When we came here, it was already here. Lastly, until God takes you out of your element and puts you into his element, you will never see his glory. You know why God has to take us out of our element? You know what the element is? What's happening around you, your, your family, your job and everything. Because every day in life, we are surrounded with distractions, noise, people clamoring for our attention. And there's no way God is going to compete with other voices. He only speaks through one head at a time. Whatever you got to do, get away from the clamoring noise. 
Maybe some folk are afraid to get away from the noise because they have been in the noise so long they're afraid to get in silence. They're afraid of their own thoughts to see themselves. Because you see, when you're in a quiet place, it makes you think. You know, no, 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 no noise, no TV, all like that. You know, and you just, and it's silent. You, you got to think. And that's where God has you then. Because the Holy Spirit starts to talk into you and starts to bring to your remembrance in terms of where you failed him. Where your weaknesses are. Where you did not want to admit this to other folk, but God says all the time, I've been knowing this. I just wanted you to admit this. And there are some things, weaknesses in our lives, you don't have to tell another person. God already knows it. Just share it with him. There are some prayers, well, let me put it this way. There are some things that we say in our prayers should not be said to other people, even those in the family, even the closest folk to you. That's heaven talk. Now, what do you do when you hit rock bottom? Moses was at rock bottom, wasn't he? From Pharaoh's palace to a desert. That's tragic. But look what God did. He took him from the sands, carried him back to the palace. And then from the palace, carried him to the entrance of the promised land. You never know what God's plan is for your life until you surrender and let God take over. Don't ever dare when he stops you in your tracks to pretend as though that you don't know him and you ignore it and still in, uh, still in arrogance and pride, you still push on as if to say, I'm going to do it my way. I don't care what you say. You're stepping on dangerous ground. Don't you know that he can take your life away in one snuff? He doesn't have to let you struggle and resist him. He could say, John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave what? That what? Okay, whosoever. We always think of that phrase as what? covering the whole world but whosoever also is personal when I surrender I am the whosoever you are the whosoever and don't you ever forget who did this for the whosoever it was Jesus Christ God's son and he did it not because we are cutie pies, sweetie pies. Did you get that? Some of you didn't kiss that. That we are golden boys. That we are the best that God has on this planet. In fact, turn it in reverse. The Father saw us as sinners in rejection to his will. And one thing about sin, sin and holiness cannot live in the same house together. Did you know that? One of them is going to go. One of them has got to go. So what Jesus did, he took your sin and my sin in his body and took all of the wrath and the thunder and the anger of God the Father it was unleashed on him and all that he went through that was for us let me go back to the Old Testament again where there was a system that whenever a man sinned he would take an animal and he would take it to the altar and press hard on the animal 
and the animal symbolized taking his sins and then the animal would be killed and that blood would atone for his sins. And year after year after year, man was slaughtering an animal in his place. But, Brother Collins, I love that book. But, when Jesus came, there was no animal to be sacrificed for man. But this time, the shepherd sacrificed his life for man. And now, on that cross, somebody said on the old rugged cross, where he was despised, put to shame, beaten, whipped, talked about. And he took all of that. He took the wrath of his father. But you see, Jesus had been to the burning bush. And when you've been to the burning bush, you know the Lord going to work it out. You don't know how. And let me tell you something. Because you are chosen doesn't mean that you, be, that you will be exempt from suffering. Because you are a Christian doesn't mean that God is obligated to put you on the high road that's smooth, that's a smooth road, and that everybody else is on the low road going through potholes and going through the bumps. No, no. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery masterpiece? No, no. While others are fighting to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. I must fight. Every day, every day, every day. I'm fighting. Fighting for my soul. Fighting to keep my mental and spiritual sanity. Because the enemy... Sometimes we underrate him, but don't you ever put Satan down. And you've heard me say in so many instances, there are some quarters that say, all you got to do is just say, Satan, get under my feet, and then stomp it like that. You don't have to worry about him no more. That is the most foolish thing I've ever heard in my life. How are you going to stop, stomp a spirit that you can't even see? I won't say whatever else I want to say. Let me give you one other example, and I'm through. This, is, this text is packed with powerful, powerful lessons. You remember Job? Remember all that he went through? All that he suffered? But more so than that, everything that he lost? Everything. His wife, because you remember she said he was a fool to still serve God and come to church in the midst of all that hell. So she walked away from him. Then his health got broken. Then the friends came. And the only thing good that they did for seven days, they didn't say nothing. They should have said nothing for the rest of their lives. But after they opened their mouths, they put both feet in their mouths. Now, can you imagine having lost your wife, your children, everything that you have uh, worked for and labored for and sweated for, gone uh, like, a, like in uh, a whisper in the night? Your health is broken. Your friends are condemning you and claiming that you should have done this. You didn't do that. That's the reason why this is happening. And there are... You know what? We got a whole lot of cousins to, do, to those friends today. Because a lot of people today think that if you're going through a trial, it's because you've done something wrong somewhere in your life. There are some people that have that crooked kind of thinking. That may be sometimes, but all the time we go through a trial doesn't mean you sin. God is trying to find out how deep the rootage of your faith is. But one thing I can say about Job. Job said, I, I'll wait until my chains come. He said, I, I, I know I got to die, 
But then, then he used a metaphor, Reverend Armstrong. He talked about a rotten tree that was cut down. Help me, Lord. He talked about a rotten tree that was cut down. And you know, when you cut down a tree, you cut off its light. The sap no longer is in that rotten tree. It doesn't bloom. But Job said, now in that rotten stump, if that stump, after being killed, can come again and sprout some green roots, then I know if I go back to the ground. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I know I'm not going to die. But there's something in me that is beyond what the ground calls for. And you know what that is? That is immortality. That is the soul of man that never dies. And Jesus said, any man that believes me and comes after me will not perish. But have what? Do you believe that? I do. I do. When you get close, close up. Let, let, me, let me say it this way. The closer you get to death, the more sober you should become. I'm including this, and some of y'all might get offended by this, but I'm saying us. I'm not saying you. Us is old folk. I'm in that, I'm in that bunch. We should not be foolish in our old age. Life and experience will teach us some things. Even if you don't know the Bible, life experiences should, should mellow you to a point that some things shouldn't even come out of your mouth. Because you remember back when you were young and some of the crazy things that folks said to you that hurt you. And that almost warped in terms of your faith and stunted your growth. But if it had not been for God, you possibly would have walked away from the church. You would have walked away from the Lord. But somebody talked to you. Somebody said something. You heard something. You saw something. Then all of a sudden that spark, that bush became alive in your heart. And you realize that it ain't folk, but it's God. And, you're not, and, and, and the life you're living here, you ain't living it for folk. See, 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 that's the problem. We're trying to impress folk. And they're on the same level I'm on. They're going to die like I'm going to die. I'm doing this to please him. And whatever he does to me, that they see. Yeah. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Can I hoop one time? Oh! Oh, yeah! Yeah. Yeah. God Almighty. Okay, we're going to our Lord's Supper, see, because some of y'all want to get out of church early. See, when I come to church, I ain't concerned about how long the service is or when I'm going to get out. I'm concerned about, see, I, I can be in a short service and leave here with nothing. I'm concerned about quality. You get me? I want to leave here fed, full. Because I come here with a lot of problems. Sometimes, sometimes my soul is heavy when I enter here. And, 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 and I need somebody to say something. I need to hear the voice of God. I need to leave here with a little bit more strength. Just a little bit more encouragement. I need to leave here with a little bit more peace. A little bit more joy. To know that my Redeemer, 
He hasn't forgotten about me. In Hebrews 13, 5, I'm re-reminded again. I'll never leave you, neither will I forsake you. Oh! Oh, Lord, have mercy. I need to leave here with something, Sister Robbins. The worst thing is to come to a service with nothing and leave with nothing. And I'm too old now to be playing religious games. Uh-uh. I got an answer to him. Not to Pleasant Green. I got an answer to him. Somebody here this morning, I don't know whether you have an intimate relationship with Christ or whether you have knowledge of Christ or whether you have a religious pedigree. But in either one of those three categories, none of them can save you. My father was a minister. I was brought up in the church. Yanked to church every Sunday, all day long, all during the week. And out of all of that surrounding, being drowned and saturated with church and religion, I despised it. And I said, when I get out of high school and go to college, I ain't never going back to church no more. <laughs> Tired of it. Yeah, that's what I said. I'm going to do my thing my way. Can't nobody make me go to church. Mom and daddy can't make me go. I'm a man now. But one day, one day old me, in my junior year, I hit my burning bush. Bam! And Reverend Harden, he started disturbing me. The Holy Spirit did. Unsettling me. Shaking me up just like you uh, shake up a malt or something. And what I thought I knew, I didn't know. And what I thought I didn't like, I did like. I was so confused, I didn't know whether I was going up or down, sideways. But the Lord straightened it out. And I remember one night, I was sitting off campus in an elderly lady, and she had me a room upstairs I mean, in her attic. And I had and I'd been battling demons for about six months. And I would reached the point I was tired. I was exhausted. I couldn't continue the battle no longer. And I couldn't even do like Jacob. I couldn't even hold on. I was ready to give up. And I remember as I, that night about 11 o'clock, this is my holy ground. I got down on that little spring cot that she put up there for me to lay on. And the Holy Spirit said, you need to talk to him. You're not, not going to get any relief unless you talk to him. Your peace is in him, not in them. And when I surrendered to him, he showed me them. Oh! I remember, and that will be my testimony until the day I die. Can't forget it. It's branded on my soul. Can't forget it. The choir is going to lead us musically in an invitational song. The most perilous thing in life is to reject the offer that Jesus gives us eternal life. And to pretend as though that I'm all right. I really don't need Jesus. And, 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 and let, let me tell you another dangerous entry point because I've heard this one before I'm young now I'm young and uh, there's nothing wrong with planting your oats 
And, uh, you know, I, I get plenty of time to think about that when I get old. But you see, the fallacy in that theory is this. First of all, you don't know whether you're going to get old. 